Welcome back to the Hand to Shoulder Solution, giving pain the middle finger. I'm your host, Carl Petito. I'm an occupational therapist and a board certified hand therapist. As a hand therapist, I specialize in treating orthopedic conditions from the fingertips through the shoulder. I want to talk to you today about distal radius fractures. It's something that's very common is what we call a fall on an outstretched hand. And when you reach down to break your fall, what usually hits first is the distal radius. And we'll talk about that. I want to actually want to show you the anatomy. I want to talk about different ways to treat that. Uh, now, let's note that this is not treatment advice or treatment direction. This is information sharing so that you can make the best decision for yourself when seeking treatment. And I want you, I want you to really understand what is the mechanics of this fracture? You know, what is it exactly? What bone are we talking about? And, you know, it's just so common that it's important for everybody to have a general awareness. So let's start with the anatomy. If I overlay this up on my hand, there's the forearm, turn palm up. Now, when I turn a palm down, and, and yes, that is a forearm movement, the radius turns over the top of the ulna. So when I turn a palm down like this, the radius bone crosses over the top of the ulna. The ulna is actually the tip of your elbow and that stays stationary. So once again, over the top of the ulna, okay? And that's a position falling, falling on outstretched hand. And there's a distal radius right here. So this is the radius. The tip of the elbow is right here. That's the ulna bone. Okay. So when this strikes the floor and I have a radius right here, let's take that off. When this hits the ground, it usually fractures around this area and this piece moves up. Now, a fracture is a break. A lot of patients ask me, ask me that question. And a fracture is just another word for a break, a broken bone. Now, the fracture can fracture. It can be just a clean line and have it non-displaced, which means it's everything's still aligned, but now there's a crack through it. Also, it could be displaced, which means now it's moved, it's shifted, and it has to get realigned so it heals in the correct alignment. Now, that realignment can be accomplished by looking at a, a, a brief, take, taking a, a regular x-ray first and then seeing is it, is it malaligned or is it still lined up the way it's supposed to be or does that have to be realigned? We can do, a, a, the surgeon can do a closed reduction, which means we're not doing any surgery they're looking at what's called fluoroscopy and they're taking a, a, a quick x-ray of it, put it back together manually, palpate it or feel it and feel that it's all aligned and take another quick shot of it and look at it and say, okay, perfect. Now it's lined up and the fracture is simple enough where they don't need plates and screws, which is called ORIF, open reduction internal fixation. We'll get to that. If they don't need plates and screws, then it can be put into a cast and then the cast removed in about six weeks and therapy begun at that time to start to restore range of motion, decrease swelling and restore strength after, after range of motion has been largely regained. But now let's go back to the thought of, let's say it's, it's so displaced where it's, it's really hard to reduce or to realign, or it's broken in multiple pieces, which is called comminution that's a comminuted fracture where you have many pieces and here's an example right here ignore the hardware for a minute but see these lines on the end of the radius bone and it goes across like this then up like that and then all around that's a situation where it really does need to put back need to be put back together if it were me and speaking for myself if this injury happened to me and a surgeon told me, you really need surgery. You should have plates and screws. I would be eager to have it done because 
the benefit of that is now the surgeon is in there, he or she has their hands on it, they're lining it up perfectly, then they're gonna use the, the perfect hardware to screw it together and it's gonna heal beautifully because it's all lined up and it's pressed together properly so it really mends very nicely. Another thing is, you know, if there's gaps or if it's if it's offset, fracture healing could be delayed. It could be a lower quality of healing. So in my mind, what's ideal is that the surgeon goes in there, gets eyes and hands on it and just makes it perfect. So let's talk about the implants. So I'll, I'll have patients come in who have had the surgery and they're asking, where are the plates? And it's a really nice let's go let's go back to the um, to the model again so here's a palmer surface let's put it so there's the back of the elbow now it's palm up like this and we're going to turn it palm down so they fall bang the end of that radius comes up or it's fractured in multiple pieces or a combination of the two and now it has to be fixed it has to be fixed internally and here's that radius bone palm down and now let's turn the palm up just so we can see the plate so the plate would go over the end of the radius and the screws would hold the fracture site together and oftentimes have a compression force so that it really heals and comes together optimally Sometimes the fracture line will go into the articular surface. Articular surface means that's the surface that articulates or connects to other bones. That's where the cartilage is. So sometimes that fracture line will go right through the cartilage. And so you can imagine if you put a, if you're the surgeon and you put plates and screws on just a surface, but now the fracture line extends into the joint surface and this area might fall away. There's some additional tools that can be added onto this plate, such as this little hook. So you see this little fork that goes around and that's holding, that's going over the watershed line and that's holding that piece of bone inward. So it's not going to fall off and it's going to heal and it's going to be in a perfect position. Now I mentioned the watershed line. If you picture a, a river flowing down here of water and this is the waterfalls, Right when it gets up to the edge and goes over the top, that's the watershed line. I think that's such a, a clever name. Another reason I mentioned the watershed line is because that plate, we don't want that plate to be beyond that watershed line at all, or, or even you know, too far up to it because that could be a relatively sharp edge that causes some friction on the tendons. And then sometimes tendons will rupture. Also, sometimes if, if one of these screws starts to back out and that it's a friction, friction point on a tendon, the tendons can rupture and then another surgery has to be done to repair the tendon. Now, the medical hardware companies uh, came up with great technology. There's locking screws on these locking plates that there's special threads in the head of the screw that actually dig into the plate and create thread lines in the plate so the screw is locked right in there and there's no chance of the screw coming out so they really thought of everything with these and uh, i actually have a plate that's not on the bone i work in the office with an orthopedic surgeon who is a fellowship trained hand surgeon specialist so we have a really great working relationship uh, in, in wonderful collaboration. So our patients get well in minimal time. And I asked him if he has this stuff so I can show you. And he, uh, he was gracious enough to let me borrow these. I want to show you another piece of technology. This collar right here is raised up off the, off of the, uh, the plate. So what that is, is a drill guide. So it, it's very handy. What, what the surgeon will do before they put in any screws, here's a plate without screws. They'll actually take some wires and push the wires through the holes into the bone and then do another quick fluoroscopy, another quick 
uh, radiograph or x-ray and see when I drill my holes and put the screws in, is it going to be, are the screws going to be in the perfect position to grab those bone fragments, to hold them where I need to hold them. And that, that I think is just, is just fascinating. And then when they look at that and say, okay, yes, they'll remove the pins, drill a hole. And in this case, there's a, a hole guide so that the drill can go through that collar, make a, make a nice pilot hole, and then they can insert the screws. You know, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but I just want you to have a general idea. There's also a, a, an, an oval screw hole here, which allows the plate to be affixed and then to be adjusted proximal to distal or south and north and really put in the optimal position and that helps the surgeon keep that where it is in the best spot. Now, if we were to take off the bone on the end, so you can look into it this way, end view, you can see the different angles of the screws. There's so purple screws, and then there's a couple of couple of pins, just a couple of posts in here too that are holding things in place. Now, here's another really good tidbit. Dr. Zafante explained to me, he said, now, if you have, for example, an older person with osteoporosis and their bone isn't very dense and, and there's, you know, a lot of, you know, it's more airy, uh, it's not real dense bone. Um, they, they make screws that actually not only lock on the top, but there's some, uh, reverse threads that will actually help pull the bone fragment upward to give a little bit of a, a, a compression force. And I just want you to be aware of that there's a lot of different tools within this tool to really give the most optimal fixation. And the body doesn't reject these. It, it, uh, the, uh, a lot of times there'll be even a calcification over the top to really secure it. The body will sometimes encapsulate some of this to what extent i don't fully know but that uh these usually do really really well it's a it's a great choice uh especially for a fracture when it has to be done it's one of those things when it has to be done it just it it has to be done um and it really aligns everything perfectly now what i do as a hand therapist i will see these oh about a week after surgery and i'll remove i'll remove the post-operative half cast, then I'll fabricate a custom orthosis and it'll be, it's a gutter over the forearm and it's a, it molds over the wrist with a moldable piece over the back of the hand, really protecting the fracture site, holding that position. And the patient can remove the brace, perform very specific range of motion to get the radius moving around the ulna. There's a thick, heavy ligament between the radius and ulna called the interosseous ligament. It's very, very thick. Once that starts to shrink, it's very hard to get the range of motion back. You know, I, in the past, I've seen patients who were immobilized for a long, long time, and they weren't able to turn their hand palm up further than this and even have having difficulty turning it palm down. And that, with this surgery, really helps us avoid all that so the patient can remove the brace do their exercises three or four times a day, and then even start some light, very light stretching, sometimes using the knee as a fulcrum. If they can't turn on their hand all the way, palm up, I'll them use their inside of their knee as a fulcrum to push it back, outside of the knee to push it toward the palm. Very light sustained stretch, 20 seconds, pulling sensation only, no pain. For the first few weeks, I'm only just having them move without pushing on themselves just to reduce range, uh, restore range of motion and loosen the tissues. And by the way, one of the best ways to increase blood flow and the way our bodies really maximize blood flow throughout the body is with movement. It's the movement squashes around fluids and helps the blood th flow through the arteries and veins. And the first two weeks is really the infl inflammatory phase of wound healing. There's going to be swelling. I inform my patients that that's normal and we're happy to see that because that's a really major part of the immune system where the lymphatic system is sending lymph fluid and it's flowing throughout the 
the the lymph vessels and that is carrying away bacteria so the first couple of weeks i don't want to be really aggressive with reduced swelling um you know wear a compression glove no and i don't even want the force of the compression glove being pulled on because the fracture is 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 pretty fresh at that point at that point so initially first couple of weeks we're, we're reintroducing range of motion and then we're after a few weeks we're starting light um self range of motion we call it for stretching at about six weeks we get rid of the splint and then we get a little more aggressive with the range of motion i could do some light traction uh, a little more forceful range of motion again not painful but just a firmer stretch and then start strengthening i like to use a hammer which you palm up palm down which strengthens many muscles at once but really the best uh, situation for quicker recovery is having the plates and screws the hardware the plate when it's warranted so thank you for watching i hope you found that to be interesting uh thank you for subscribing to the channel I look forward to talking to you more thank you